Hello and welcome to Rajya Sabha Television. You're watching this special telecast with me, Frank Rausen Pereira. HIV targets set for 2020 will not be reached owing in part to deeply unequal access to antiretroviral therapy and service disruptions caused by the COVID-19 pandemic, according to a new UN AIDS report released last week. The report, seizing the moment, warns that the remarkable achievements made in the fight to end AIDS have not been shared equally within and between countries. Moreover, decades of hard-won gains could be lost if uh, the world fails to act. Missed targets have resulted in more than 3.5 million HIV infections and 8,20,000 AIDS-related deaths since 2015 than if the world was on track to meet the 2020 targets. And the global AIDS response could be set back by 10 years or more if COVID-19 disrupts HIV services. To talk about the report, how has the pandemic derailed HIV targets and what have we learned from epidemics in the past to deal with the pandemic at present? I have with me on the program today the Executive Director of UN AIDS, Ms. Vini Bianjima. Welcome to the show. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me on your show, Frank. Uh, let me begin my uh, interview with the most simple and the most basic question about your uh, report that came out last week, uh, which was uh, titled Seizing the Moment. What are the key findings of the report? Well, first, the report shows that there's been remarkable progress over the last 10 years, but highly unequal progress. Most of the progress is in expanding access to antiretroviral therapy, where there is, it's lagging is very much on the side of preventing. These are, because these achievements, the huge achievements made, haven't been shared equally within and between countries, our global HIV targets for this year, 2020, will sadly not be achieved. So it's a, it's a, a report of mixed results, great achievements in some parts of the world, not good achievements elsewhere, and therefore in total not hitting our targets. We also see, sadly, 1.7 million people globally who, are, who were newly infected last year. That's three times the target which we had set of 500,000. So we are off track. Secondly, you see a region like Eastern Europe and Central Asia, where new infections are coming down in India, in Southern Africa and Eastern Africa, in this region, they are increasing and increasing by 72% since 2010. We know that this is mainly amongst people who inject drugs, gay men, those are the categories that are most at risk in that region. We also see increases in Latin America and Middle East. Deaths, sadly, we lost 690,000 people last year. Yet we have treatment. Not a single death should have happened. But we know that there are many, many people for whom access to what the science offers is not there because they are criminalized, sometimes discriminated, stigmatized, too poor, so there are all those barriers we have to work on to prevent infections, new infections, and to reduce deaths. Right. Okay. Go, let me end on the good news. Treatment. There are over 38 million people living with HIV today. We've been able to put 25.4 million people on treatment. That's huge success. But... 12.6 other people are not on treatment yet. So, work to do. Absolutely. There is a lot of work to be done. And this is where, you know, people like you and organizations like UN AIDS really have been doing a great job in helping the world in trying to deal with this particular epidemic as such. Talking about epidemic, let's not forget that we have a pandemic that we are dealing with at a time like this as well. So, you know, how is the pandemic derailing the HIV targets and the HIV uh, goals? You know, the coronavirus uh, and HIV are two colliding epidemics in many countries, developing countries. As I said, we were already off track 
to meet the targets for 2020. But this coronavirus is threatening to blow us completely off course. We need to put a warning there. And you have just said it in your introduction that our modeling, first of all, we are monitoring on the ground. How is the epidemic affecting the HIV response? In many ways, one, supplies, disruption of supplies. And that's why I'm so happy to be on your program, speaking to parliamentarians in your country and in your whole country, India. You are the pharmacy of the world. You produce 80% of the medicines for treating people with HIV. Now, your factories are now lined up with orders for health technologies for COVID, whether it is the personnel protection equipment, test kits, or even the new drugs that are helping on treatment. There is a lot of demand for coronavirus technologies. This is beginning to affect the supplies for HIV technologies, antiretroviral treat, uh, medicines, and other treatments such as pre-exposure prophylaxis for, for uh, prevention. So condoms are also needed for prevention. So we are saying to manufacturers, don't pursue the highest profit, keep all the commodities flowing from your factories. That's one. Two, transportation routes have been disrupted. A cargo is moving, but within countries, borders closing, there are delays in moving things, commodities to users. Three, lockdowns. Lockdowns have cut off people who need treatment or prevention from their service points. So many people are not getting their treatments. We are advising governments to put people on multi-month dispensing so they collect for a longer period of time and not lose their supplies. But lockdowns are hurting not only supplies, they are hurting the human rights of people. We've heard of migrants who got stuck miles and miles away from their homes when lockdowns came without taking into account that migrant workers need to move back home. We've heard of human rights abuses, sex workers, gay people being denied, transgender being denied social protection like food that is being given out to people who have lost jobs. They are discriminated and not given what others have. We've heard of shaming of sex workers being blamed and made victims. You are the ones who have brought the corona here. So human rights violations are another constraint that is pushing people away from treatment. We are seeing also that repurposing, that all the services that were created for HIV, community-led services, laboratories, so much is being repurposed for corona. We don't think it's bad to benefit from corona, from HIV experience, but we have to be creative and use the same services to fight both epidemics, not to drop one for another. So those are some of the impacts that are, if continued for another six months and remain severe, we could lose an extra 500,000 deaths in Africa alone and other reversals. So it is serious. It is important that decision makers know how to keep the two responses going at the same time. Absolutely. I think we have to have at least a two-pronged approach and try and deal with both corona and HIV together because if you try to neglect one, then there's a big possibility and a big chance that, you know, it may get out of control is what you're suggesting. So it's good to have a two-pronged approach and, uh, and address both the issues. So talking about that, uh, Vinny, what decisive action needs to be taken immediately in the near future and also in the next couple of years, maybe if you have to fight HIV? Okay, first of all, we are faced with a second pandemic that is not going away very soon. 
we need to understand that we are going to continue fighting HIV in a context of another devastating pandemic. Always epidemics follow or thrive on and make worse inequalities. To deal with an epidemic is not just a health issue. You must deal with the inequalities along which it moves in order to cut it off. So we have to focus very, very much on the social and economic factors that make people vulnerable. That way you are tackling both at the same time. So that's why I keep talking about this social protection that must be there for vulnerable groups. That's why we must put communities at the center so that they lead their own responses, they innovate their own solutions. Who can tell a woman who works in a market or in, on, a, on a building site in India how to social distance? It is only her and her friends working in their context who will know how to social distance, how to maintain hygiene, how to find water when there's no water. So we must put communities at the center of fighting both epidemics. We must respect human rights. This is the time to decriminalize same-sex relationships. This is the time to decrim decriminalize sex work. This is the time to de decriminalize uh, the personal use of drugs, personal use, not trafficking, but personal use of drugs. These things will bring people forward to be treated and to be safe. Thirdly, financing. We must not take money away from poor people. We must give access to poor people their right to health. This is non-negotiable. If people have to pay to go to a clinic, they are not going to go for a test to find out if they are safe to, to, for public safety. They will not go. So the right to public provision of health services is critical. And let me say one last thing. The injustice in the global system on access to health must end. Today, we are seeing a rush to book out all the vaccines for corona. We are saying this is an injustice. The health workers who are dying on the front lines must be supplied first, whether they are in India or Uganda or Guatemala or America. Health workers should come first to be protected before any rich country books out a vaccine. So access, equal access to treatments, so that nobody is in the back of, no country is in the back of the queue dying while others are being treated because they have money. So equal access, equal distribution, large scale manufacturing, sharing the technology between regions, those who are capable like your region in India, you're capable, Brazil is capable, Indonesia is capable, sharing the science so that this manufacturing going on across the world and nobody's waiting. These are some of the immediate things that we are fighting for mm -hmm. because the two epidemics must be fought at the same time. Absolutely. You know, every time that there is a health emergency or something like this happens, it's the marginalized that, you know, that are most vulnerable and, are, and suffer the most. What needs to be done to protect the rights and safeguard the interests of the downtrodden? You know, first it is, because I'm focusing on epidemics, it is about having equal human rights, everybody being valued in the same way without judgment. What we are seeing in the area of health one is that the private sector has been put forward as the solution and governments have been given uh, a break from finding the resources to finance health care for everyone. That is the first thing we must correct, that governments have a duty to provide certain essential public services like health, like education. We cannot afford to sell it and then have a society that is cohesive we have to provide. And providing might mean that the private sector is 
supplying government, but government must ensure that people at the point of delivery are not paying. The private sector can play a role, but it has to play a role that does not bring the cost to the ordinary person because then you widen inequalities once you put a cost. 100 million people every year fall into poverty because of medical bills. 10,000 people die every day because of lack of access to health care. This is unacceptable. So that's one. Two, human rights. Because you can't have the services there. You can't have free health care. But you can have young people, gay people, gay, gay and lesbian and transgender people. You can have sex workers. You can have many people failing to show up to get care because of abuse of human rights, discrimination, stigma, they will not come forward. So uh, tackling criminalization of certain rights of particular sexual minorities, criminalization of sex work, these are important. Tackling also the attitudes of health workers towards citizens. They must deliver with full respect of the human rights of everybody and non-discrimination, non-judgment. Often, even women don't show up to clinics when they need them because they don't want to be abused. Women don't give birth. They die in homes in many countries because at the clinics they are treated like subhuman. So changing the way services are delivered so that the duty bearer is accountable to the citizen is critical. So those are some of the things. The financing is key, the human rights is key, and communities, communities at the center playing a role in prevention and in preparedness for epidemics. Absolutely. I think you stressed enough about the role of community really in trying to deal with healthcare emergencies such as this because it is the community and the immediate uh, you know, surroundings that can help a person or that can be a first responder, really, as far as such kind of situations are concerned. You know, uh, this issue of stigma is something that I want to take up with you. I'll come to that in just a bit. But before that, you know, let's talk about uh, the lessons that we have learned, really, because, you know, AIDS or HIV has been around for some time now and we've been dealing with it. You know, everyone has been trying to deal with it for some for several decades. What is the lesson that we have learned from it and how can we, you know, use those lessons that we have learned to deal with Corona as well? You know, Frank, you ask a very good question because across the board, we are see this disease has been with us, HIV AIDS, for 40 years plus. And UNAIDS has been in existence for 25 years, a joint program of the UN to help countries to fight. But we are seeing today that the countries that are quite successful in turning back corona, in getting a hold on it, are in the developing world, are very much those countries that are taking the best lessons out of HIV and applying them on the corona side. What are those? One I have already mentioned is about the role of communities. That one, you need it. Two, take, having a multi-sectoral approach. In many countries, you just see a purely health approach. You see epidemiologists maybe with the politicians driving a response. That is failing because the epidemic is not just a health issue. It's a social issue. It's about how people live in their communities. It's about relationships between men and women. It's about how the workplace and how it is structured, the transport system. So you need your sociologists, you need your economists, you need your community workers, you need women on the front lines. You need all those in the uh, response so that it is balanced and it's addressing every side of an epidemic. That is key. Third, I mentioned human rights. It's about human rights of people. If you don't respect them, you will be fighting and fighting and never ending an epidemic. Fourth, resourcing. 
adequate resourcing. You can't fight an epidemic by taking away from another epidemic. You have to be fighting on all the fronts. And on this one, I have to say that developing countries have been shortchanged because many of them were already in dire situation economically. Many low-income countries were already highly indebted, paying more to debt than putting in the health system. A country like Zambia, Zambia has in the last four or five years increased its debt repayments by 700% and cut its health budget by 30% to pay the debt. That is common across the low-income countries. The middle-income countries were also entering recession. A country like South Africa had entered recession. Now, with this they don't have the money to plow into their health systems to fight into an epidemic. We need solidarity. This is a global problem. We know that it's moving from one country across the whole world. So we need solidarity so that every country can fight because Secretary General Guterres has said, no one is safe until all of us are safe. So we need the solidarity, the resources coming from richer countries to shore up the scarce resources in the poorer countries. Absolutely. You know, uh, since we are here, I must ask you this. Has the coronavirus pandemic really exposed the vulnerable, uh, vulnerable healthcare systems that we have around the world? Because we've seen, you know, some of the best countries with the best healthcare systems crumble under the pressure of the COVID-19. Oh, this one has been a very important lesson because uh, while so many of us were, have been campaigning for years and years on this issue of the right to health care and insisting that profits of companies cannot come before the right to life and to health and that governments must deliver, we were proven right this time. Why? Look at two fronts. Health systems. Those who had health system that is based on private provision. Those who didn't have well-developed social protection mechanisms to take care of the elderly, the sickly, the, the disabled, those who didn't have good publicly provided systems struggled, even in the richest countries in the world. You know the ones I'm talking about. You had people dying in huge numbers because they can't afford it. So that is one thing, public provision of and strengthening of health systems and social protection. We found that even poor countries which had invested well in public health, in social protection, were fighting back better. Two, access to, 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 to all the commodities that you need. Many countries, very rich, found themselves totally dependent on China for things like masks and gloves and so on and didn't have, and their health workers were dying, and they were so rich because they were not investing in, their own, in building their own sustainability of their own system. Health was not seen as a risk even to the economy. Now they saw the economy is crashing because they, had, they were not prepared. So preparedness is an important, important lesson. And we saw countries that had invested well, doing well. You know, a country like Thailand. Thailand has a health system that's mostly provided by the public pass. Thailand has a good health system. In fact, people come there for medical tourism. Thailand didn't struggle hard. They were able to contain this. Korea is a rich country, but Korea had invested also strongly in a public health system and in social protection of children, of elderly. Of It was one of the best performers. So we learn about the role of government. Now look at this money in the vaccine. That's another lesson. We have been told for years that, and. I have to salute India, you are the ones who challenged this. People 
people died between 1996 and 2005, there, around there, 10 years, 2006, people were dying of AIDS in Africa, in Asia, wherever, when there was a treatment. The treatment was there, but was too expensive, $10,000 per person per year. Now, you challenged that system and started providing generics. The prices came down and everybody, most people are now on treatment. But do you know that the system never changed of putting profits, intellectual property protection before the right health. But look today, that system has crumbled. Corona has crushed it. Billions have been put down from public funds by the rich countries to find a vaccine. Telling right. you that clearly the system of private sector being the one to give us our medicines is wrong, is immoral, is impracticable. So now we must change the system permanently. And countries like India should be at the forefront of pushing for this system to change where those who hold a patent can keep people dying because they are charging a profit. We must change that. So those are some, for me, of the very, very important lessons we've learned about inequalities in health and the cost they can have on the whole of society, including crushing economies. We have a lot right. to pick up on. Absolutely. One final question before I let you go, Winnie, you know, this issue of stigma, I told you I'll come back to it later. You know, mm -hmm. this is a problem really as far as uh, COVID-19 is concerned as well. Many people are ashamed or are, are, are worried about the stigma attached to it, the same as HIV. Yeah. Stigma is terrible, you know, because it plays out differently on different things. The stigma now on COVID-19 and the stigma on HIV are not the same, but they are layered. So if you are an HIV positive person, the stigma, stigma for carrying that virus. Now, if you also were to get COVID, there will be an additional layer. And if you got say TB, which is also common amongst HIV patients, HIV positive people, you will get another layer of stigma for being, uh, for being infected with TB. So stigma is a killer. I can end by telling you that I lost my own brother to stigma because he had lived with HIV in France, healthy, but when he returned to my country, Uganda, and he was afraid of stigma and did not go to collect his treatment, it was there, he deteriorated and we lost him. He lost the battle in 2006. That was stigma. He had the treatment in France. There was no stigma. Nobody noticed him. He got his treatment. It was okay. In Uganda, where he was known, back home, he lost his life to stigma because he was too scared to be seen at the clinic getting treatment. So I'm speaking about this with emotion too, that we must fight stigma. And it is communities who are best at this. The government should put money to communities to fight these social norms that hurt people. Whether it is stigma, whether it is the condoning of violence against women, whether it is a stigma because of your ethnicity or whatever reason you are discriminated, fight it and get communities to fight it. People die needlessly when stigma, when faced with stigma. Absolutely. Winnie, thank you so much for joining me on the program. Sorry for your loss. Thank you for sharing uh, your, your personal experience with us as well and opening up on this interview and talking to us about how to deal with these, uh, with the pandemic and the epidemic and what are the lessons that we've learned really as far as uh, HIV is concerned and how we can implement that to try and deal with COVID-19 as well. A pleasure having you on the program. Thank you so much for joining me on Rajasabha TV. Thank you so much, Frank. You're a great interviewer. 
and thank you for the opportunity. Thank you so much. All right, with that, I'll call it a wrap. Thank you for watching. See you again next time. Bye-bye.